I'm Eva Kustrup. I'm uh, born in Germany and I live in Berlin now since 40 years. And for my political life, I think it was important that I have been born in August 45, which is a month when the first nuclear bombs were thrown on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was the first summer in a sense, a summer of hope too in Europe because in May, on the 8th of May, the Second World War ended. And I come out of a family of people who had been against the Nazis and suffered a lot in the war. So I think I'm a child of hope that the wars uh, end and that crimes like in the Holocaust and in the Second World War would be never repeated and all the sufferings of women and children too and civilians in war. So I think that's a little bit the message and task of my life given me by my family and all those who I respect very much from the German and German Jewish resistance against the Hitler um, and Stalin uh, regimes. That I became something like a first grassroots activist and then later a leader of different social movements I think important for me was what I learned in um, the student movement against the Vietnam War. And this is my link then with many social movements we had in Europe and Germany. There was the civil rights movements in the United States with Martin Luther King and we heard about and I as a daughter of a Protestant priest could identify a lot with the speeches of Martin Luther King and his dream speech and, and the nonviolent resistance uh, of Rosa Parks um, and others. So that was inspiring us a lot. And then we were shocked that some students have been shot at the Kent University. And then a friend of mine even was shot by a right-wing policeman in Berlin uh, the day when the Shah of Persia, uh, nowadays called Iran, was visiting Berlin and going to the wonderful Mozart opera. So that was a big break in my life and in many students in Berlin and some West German cities at that moment that we suddenly in our life, it was a life after the wars with new hopes, with Kennedy, anti-colonization movements growing uh, and the student movements against the Vietnam War for more democracy at the universities, for better curricula, for public education, for good public education which we had and for reforms within the education systems. But then suddenly to experience yourself with your own body and very near to you um, that a friend of you is shot by a right-wing policeman it was in a rally uh, against the Shah regime and then to hear from the Kent. And then the year later in uh, April 68, Martin Luther King was shot and Kennedy was shot uh, and Robert Kennedy was shot. And I think this was something like sh shattering and disturbing many of us and gave us a hint that probably we would have to stand against more problems and against dark forces in our life too and could not just go on like easy uh, happy hippies <laughs> but that we would have to organize that such political murder uh, does not um, happen again and maybe that is um, the um, for me the obligation from the experience with the murder of Martin Luther King and of Benno Unesorg and the attempt to murder a leader of the student movement in Germany Rudi Dutschke who was a friend of mine to learn how we can organize our democratic social movements in a way that we do not make it too easy to the right-wing police or to a state which is opposing us, that they we fall into traps and that they can split us or that we run into the trap to become violent ourselves because then it is always easier to make lies and demagogy and say, oh, they are demons, they are left radicals, they are communists, they are violent and so on. So I think that was my heritage given by those people who suffered the, suffered the uh, political um, murders uh, to think about what we could learn from them either from Gandhi or from Martin Luther King but then I found out too we can learn a lot from the women's peace movement which had been in German history it was not in our school books it was not taught as universities but there had been a very strong and intelligent and non-violent women's peace movement in Germany before the First World War and before the Second World War and then during. And they st started even at that time in 1915. They had the first international women's peace conference with American Women for Peace, Jane Addams and others, um, to meet in uh, The Hague. 
And you know now, The Hague is the center of the International Court of Crime. And then in my life, inspired by Scandinavian Women for Peace, by French Women for Peace, Swiss Women for Peace, and then by Women for Peace and Women's Strike for Peace uh, against nuclear testing in the South Pacific and in the United States. Anyway, we joined hands again after 50, 60, 70 years of that movement had been there. And we're doing vigils in The Hague, in front of nuclear power plants, in front of nuclear weapon sites in um, Germany, which was in South Germany, maybe some of you remember Mutlangen, where we had a block non-violent blockade, even together with Petra Kelly, uh, my good friend and co-founder of the Greens, and with a Nobel uh, Prize winner for literature, Heinrich Böll, and I think some American soldiers, included some black American soldiers, will remember these moments that suddenly these Germans, and they knew them as, oh, they have, some of them maybe have been Nazis, and Germany was rather militaristic in its history. Suddenly, black and white American soldiers were confronted with very committed nonviolent Germans, and from at least three different generations. So we, we learned a lot from the civil rights movements here. And we learned uh, from the anti-Vietnam War protests that we have to look into the different reasons of war, that we have to look if the wars are done to go into oil resources, uh, who is uh, uh, winning a lot of money by these wars, uh, So, um, and then who are the scientists, who are the counterinsurgency scientists, who are the engineers producing weapons like Agent Orange, which is still killing the forests in Vietnam and where there are still children uh, born of that time who are handicapped and suffering a lot. So one of our results of the protest against the Vietnam War was to rethink science and to rethink technological developments because we found the Hiroshima bomb, Agent Orange in Vietnam War have been done by modern science and ha have been praised like the atoms for peace then after the nuclear bomb as big progress, big progress of technology. And we thought we as students at the university have to commit ourselves to another type of science and to help to develop a te technology which is more responsible for democracy, which is more serving the real needs of millions of people in the world who are suffering hunger. And so much of the defense budget and of the science budget is going in the direction of developing weapons. And they are even did not give an enough budget to stop malaria, millions of people suffering malaria in Africa and India. So that was a big result of the student movement in Germany from 68, 67, to change the understanding what intellectuals, what students should do, and that they have more knowledge about their what is happening with the defense budget and that they have more knowledge about where the research budget is going and that we try to educate students and intellectuals and academics to look into the priorities of research going to um, an ecological science, going into a science which is more open for women and more open for the poor. And so we even got encouragement from Latin America because similar things were happening in Latin America. So in Latin America, there were these social movements like in the time of Allende, um, which was then uh, killed down by, with the help of the CIA and Pinochet. But they developed in Latin American universities too, the idea that how we have to change the universities and science that they're serving, serving the people and how this hierarchy of science and the careers of science have to be more open for democratic monitoring and to relate to people who are coming from workers' families, uh, to women who are come from poor families, and not just to give them a chance to make careers, like you often say in the US, like Obama had its big chance, but that during their career, they are not forgetting where they are coming from and what their career, to whom their career then should serve. The student movement, which was partly a global social movement, if you look, there have been events in Japan too, in Latin America, in Australia, and in the United States and in Europe, brought as one result to the women's movement. And the women's movement 
was coming out that many women have been in the active in the anti-war movement in the more democracies at, at the university movement but then they realized that the political movement itself was very much dominated by men and their long speeches and that they thought ah the women are getting the children we are the revolutionaries we are the revolutionaries we are the big leaders of the student movement and so the women should look for the ch children the women should make the coffee in the teach-ins and they should be beautiful and young and so on and some women like in the US in Germany too uh, they were so angry about that that they were that they the, uh, these leftist and student movements men were playing as if they would have the historic role of big former revolutionaries relating to Lenin or Mao and so on or Che Guevara, but not lo looking that they are exploiting. Uh, their husbands that they're exploiting other women in their daily and real life and out of it came a wonderful action that a, a, a friend of mine I adored her a lot because she was doing um, she was representing us in one of the committees what a work which I would never had, have dared to do at that time to speak to the academics and be in a committee so she was very fine dressed and did not did not look at all like a hippie or radical very fine dressed very elegant in her talk but then suddenly in such this meeting of the left students she took her tomatoes which she had bought and was throwing the tomatoes to the all male speakers there on the stage and that then was a big uh, um, uh, a big break and then they had a manifesto and the next women students after the tomato throwing to their own colleagues and companions she said let us have our speech now so she made a big speech about the uh, liberation of women, that uh, the daily life exploitation of women, exploitation of sexuality and body of women, uh, the, co the, the partnership sharing of the work to caring children and all that was included in the speech and from then uh, women started to organize their own women self-help groups and they started kindergartens, alternative kindergartens where uh, where the parents and not just the state but the parents themselves were involved and that they wanted to have a less authoritarian education especially in Germany so that was a education of children for creativity for tenderness uh, for um, social relations learning solidarity learning to live in a team and looking for handicapped looking for the weaker so to integrate that in new type of children's education and then the women's movement started to learn from the Boston Health Collective which we're doing this wonderful book on women's body and our bodies ourselves so similar things were starting in Germany and we learned from one another I think and so the first women's health center I was involved with friends starting that um, in Berlin and then as I myself became a teacher I left university because I did not want to make a normal career as a professor who gets his lifelong pension and does not ask where the money for the pension is coming from so I thought we need intellectuals and, and competent people and knowledgeable people who link more with grassroots democracy, who are not staying in their ivory tower at universities and writing big books and giving big speeches only, but who have more links with the real community and with other public education bodies and in that sense to give something back to the society by not just staying in universities. So I became an teacher at high school and then I started with friends the first feminist education project and I started to become a member of the teachers union and I'm still though I'm not anymore a teacher but I've found it so important like many of us that we learn the lesson of German fascism one of the conditions of the Second World War II and of the Holocaust was that the trade unions in Germany got destroyed and that they, that they have thrown nearly all the leaders of the German trade unions into concentration camps uh, and beside the leaders of the Social Democratic Party and the Communist Party and some uh, Christian leaders so for me it's one very deep deep message what to learn how to learn our lessons from the Second World War and from uh, the learn the lesson how to prevent fascism is that we need good and free and strong trade unions included not just metal workers union not just the workers union but including unions for the teachers and maybe for the serving serving industry and it was very so within 
we did not just become member, like in many professions then, like teachers, doctors, lawyers, social workers, we went into these professions by saying we have to serve the society and not just be in our intellectual academic circles. Within going into these pr professions, we try to take a little bit that spirit with us of hope and democratic change and uh, to look what we could change within the professions. You see, get some bureaucracy out or get this uh, too much competition between the colleagues out. So Doctor Collective started to then uh, started to do teamwork as doctors. Some doctors organized going to the migrant sector of the city. You see we have many Turkish, uh, we are the, sec uh, the second biggest Turkish city Berlin outside of Turkey. So more than 100,000 Turkish Kurdish people are living in Berlin. They came as the workers for the dirty waste and, and the automobile industry. Now they are in different jobs. But I think that was a very good um, pilot project that some doctors said we are not going to serve the rich as doctors but and make beauty operations or things like that. But we go and open um, a healthcare center, an interdisciplinary healthcare center in the suburb where the migrants are living because they have special needs, like women have special needs in health and children have special needs in health. So that was a wonderful development which started in the 70s and which you could say now you can see um, flourishing in some parts but but now fighting the pharmaceutical industry because, and fighting uh, big hospital chains who, who just get the money out of the patients and sometimes you get more ill in a hospital and or you have to, a lot of money is going in unnecessary operations and so on. So these health collectives of that time, some of them try to go on and to give informations um, to, 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 uh, to get, uh, to get any control of the pharmaceutical industry, which is controlling the research too. And then in the other field of the lawyers, there was an interesting development first to have any women lawyers. You see, we nearly had no women lawyers and when we started to study. So that was a pilot project too, to have women lawyers and then even to have feminist lawyers who then went into the issue of, issue of daily violence against women or into the rights of people who rent a home because many people in Germany do not have do not buy houses like here but it's a very good tradition to have social housing and to rent a room or a house but then we have the rights the written laws for people who rent and so some people became lawyers and specialized on that and that was very important for us because by that we could control that the prices for rent and rent uh, an apartment are, were, not, were not rising uh, too much and that we could keep something like a social housing sector um, within Germany. The other field were architects and city planners. They came out of that student movement time too by different visions, by new visions, similar like some here in the US. So we got people going into city planning, how you can have cities where not the cars are dominating, where not supermarkets are dominating. So I'm very happy that Berlin has not any big mall till now. We do not have any skyscrapers till now. And in Berlin is a city with wonderful public transport till now, with a lot of space and security for bike riders. And that is a result of, you could say, a 30 years, nearly 40 years struggle now. But the struggle is not just grassroots protest in the street, which we are going on to do. But what we learned with the second wave, you could say, of the movements, to go into professions, to collect competence in different fields and then change these professions and give them a new uh, field of work and uh, like the architects now are going into energy saving, energy efficiency and solar architecture. In the beginning they went into the issue of social housing and maybe how to change the cooking place for women so that the working place for women is not fully separated from the family and women do not have to work so isolated. And we could return with our new ideas, uh, with our social movements in Germany, doing what we were doing, finally found out, oh, we are not the first. Ah, there are others who are trying to do it in the United States. But we found out too that before fascism in Germany has been a strong reform movement to reform schools, to reform health, to give women more space and, and voice 
and um, we could relate to that. And that is, there is a Bauhaus school, maybe some of you know, the Bauhaus architecture tradition, they said there should be more light in the housing and uh, there should be less, yes, and then changing the, the parks. One, uh, so even at that time, wonderful park architects. And we, in a way, we are, we thought we start new, but now we find out ah, we are re revitalizing and renewing reform traditions and democratic traditions which, and social movements which have been in Germany and in Europe before. And that gives me a, a joy now in my life where I have been getting older that I think um, the student movement, the women's movement, then the starting anti-nuclear energy and ecology movement and then all together in the huge peace movement in Germany in the 80s against the nuclear weapons and for peace education and for civil conflict resolution that in a way we had the chance to build alternatives, democratic alternatives up after the war. And I'm in a way proud uh, that some thousands of us and then even now millions voting for the Greens or for good social democrats or now for the left party. So I can say millions of voters are supporting it and that is a little joy and a little proud and hope I want to bring to uh, the United States now when Obama has been elected that you see and do not forget oh we should use that time to relink again with European and German good social movements and expertise we have developed and even changes within administration we even achieved changes within government politics in the energy field development field and um, public transport and public education fields. So this is my message here that we relink. We had good links in the early anti-nuclear energy movement here in California and the United States. We learned a lot from Emery Lovins, from Ecotopia, from uh, Kallenbach and all the great anti-nuke activists here in the USA. There have been at a common hearing in 1977 in Hanover where we had rallies against the nuclear reprocessing plant in Gorleben with hundreds and thousands of farmers coming with their tractors and then farmers' wives, housewives, priests, radical urban feminists like I have been at that time from Berlin. So it was a 10,000 people's rally at least and we had a hearing together with Californian ecologists and Californian anti-nuke scientists. So we have to relink to go back to that good cooperation and maybe to be rather quick now, to be rather clear now so that the, the debate we have now about the financial crisis and economic crisis, ecological crisis which are all interlinked and I would even say it is a cultural crisis too because this type of car culture and oil consuming culture, this high level arms race budget for me is no culture. You see, it is a break of civilization and it's a self-destructive uh, culture. So we have a cultural and moral crisis too in this ecological, financial and economic uh, crisis. So when they speak now about a new deal to come out of this economic and uh, job crisis, and in a way they have been stealing stolen our Green Party slogan from Germany, New Green Deal. But nice, they can take the copyright, but they should not do then greenwashing. They should really do a new Green Deal in Europe and in the United States. But that means that in the economic stimulus, in the bailing out, first the bailing out should not be just social help for the bankers who are uh, with all these bonuses and the obscene uh, manager money and uh, now get in a way social help but the bailout should be structured in a way that it is helping uh, the poorest and that is helping to build a public social e economic sector. It should go first to public education, to public health, uh, to public transport and in within that field you can create a lot of jobs and it should go to renewable energies and like we did it in Germany now at least since 10 years and the the so-called New Green Deal has to exclude nuclear power. It has to exclude um, to give money in new nuclear power plants. It has to exclude to give money to new coal plants. And we have to learn from one another as quick as possible with good alternative independent studies 
how we can make new energy plans for our countries who are independent from fossil fuel, who are independent from coal mines and especially independent uh, from nuclear power. I don't, do not think that I have to explain it too much why, but I maybe can give some of the reasons why nuclear power has to be excluded from the new uh, Green Deal, which I learned in the 70s with the anti-nuclear energy movement in Germany and in France. First, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons are intrinsically linked. So there was first the testing in the Nevada side in July um, 45, and then um, the bomb, and only, and I think Robert Oppenheimer, about whom I have been working when I was a literature teacher, so in, I met him in literature in 73, so I worked about Robert Oppenheimer and Teller. I know that Oppenheimer at least got something like a moral sh shock afterwards, realizing what he has been involved in. Teller never thought about his uh, moral responsibility. He is going on like crazy at the teller uh, with space weapons. He has been advising Reagan and so on. But Oppenheimer at least got a moral shock and I think that some of these scientists having been involved in the Manhattan Project, they thought now, besides some business and some Pentagon or other poli policy makers, oh, how do we sell this now to the world? If they see the pictures of Hiroshima, they will not like it. So they created that slogan, Atoms for Peace, which sounds wonderful, you see. You had this ugly weapon and now you make Atoms for Peace. But that is only advertisement and, and denying that you cannot have so-called Atoms for Peace without the possibility that from the plutonium, which is coming out of the waste of each nuclear power plant, you are able to make nuclear weapons. And I don't know what country you have to have, what type of democracy you have to have to control that the waste of the nuclear power plant is not misused for nuclear weapons. Besides that there is that possible misuse and very difficult to control, there is the proliferation uh, as an interest of many countries. And as the United States had the bombs, the Soviet Union wanted to have the nuclear bomb, and we know that the co part of the Cold War was this, beside other forms of arms race, was this nuclear arms race, which has now brought the overkilling, overkill capacities of nuclear weapons, and that they are not only the overkill of nuclear weapons with the former Soviet Union, which is now in Russia and in the USA, but that France and England followed, that then China followed, that Israel has a nuclear weapon, that uh, Brazil and Argentine bought nuclear power plants from Germany to use them for nuclear weapons, that South Africa tried to get a nuclear power plant and use it for a nuclear weapon. Pakistan, I find rather horrible, with this Mr. Khan, the so-called father of the Pakistan nuclear bomb. It's, it's um, yes, as a person who is loving children, I hate it that something can be said like father of a nuclear bomb because nuclear plants and the whole nuclear cycle, starting with the uranium mining, then the testing and then the waste problems is against life. It's against women who want to give birth. It's against parents who want to give their children into a healthy world with healthy water, with healthy earth and plants and animals. So anyway, we shot all those guys, better call them gangsters or scientific criminals or something like that. So this Mr. Khan uh, learned it in the Netherlands. He worked in the Netherlands as a student. A little bit he took from Germany. So he tried to get the so-called secrets of the nuclear industry to bring it to Pakistan. And what I find tragic and I get angry about is that these so-called fathers of the nuclear bomb in India and in Pakistan sell it to their population where there are millions poor for their national identity to say, look, now we have the nuclear bomb too. With this, our national identity is strengthened. Now we are in development. And I think that is a big lie and a big exploitation of all the people uh, in India and Pakistan living in the rural areas. And they need clean water, they need good food, they, they need um, good education, they need some money that all the girls can go to school. And uh, this nuclear bomb in India and Pakistan, like in other countries, is, is getting a big part of the budget of the country. And then the budget is, there is not money, they say then, we have not money 
uh, enough money for unemployment uh, security, we have not enough money for public health and public schools, but it's a high budget which is going in nuclear industry and in nuclear weapons. So um, I um, think that is one of my strongest arguments against nuclear plants that is interlinked by the plutonium, which is essential for nuclear weapons, and it's interlinked by the proliferation. And it will bring, it can even um, be bring a disaster to the whole world by the nuclear winter, which can come by computer errors too. It not just has to come that Ahmadinejad now with his type of pseudo-national uh, identity can compete with Bush and Putin. Oh, now we have nuclear weapons too. Now we are independent and our culture is respected. Now it's crazy to feel respected as a culture and as a country by the symbol of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, but uh, uh, it is a possibility that not just Ahmadinejad, not just the government from North Korea, but just by a computer accident, nuclear weapons can bring disaster. So we have to bring the whole nuclear industry down and make it clear to the people in Europe, but in all countries, that they are robbed by giving the budget to nuclear energy. They are robbed of their future, they are robbed of their taxes, and so on. But the other thing, which may be a, a real reason now for you too here in the US to campaign against including the uh, uh, money, billions of money going to nuclear industry is the nuclear energy is no answer to climate change. They try to sell us now in Europe too and in Germany because we have the plan to go out of the nuclear energy since six years. We have it as government law to go out of nuclear energy in a sort of phase out plan follow by this Denmark, follow Austria, follow Italy and follow all those countries who are happy to live without any nuclear power plant. But Germany is the first leading industrial country which has a phase out plan, not in the on, on desk, but it's a plan as government law to phase out nuclear energy and by that increase renewables. So we have a doubling of renewable energies now in Germany from 5 to 10 percent of the part of the energy supply. And we are doing it not only because of that link with nuclear weapons, which is very near to Germans because we have had nuclear weapons of Russia and the US on our both territories so that it's so-called nuclear theater could happen and Germany, both Germanys would be contaminated by that so-called nuclear theater. But in a way there is a big consciousness in Germany too that we have a responsibility to the so-called third world. That means we have to look how we stop uh, world hunger. We have to look how we stop mainly diseases who millions of people are suffering and not just the diseases of some super rich. So that means we need the money to go into good development politics and uh, not to get so much money into the nuclear industry. And the nuclear industry could only grow uh, the last uh, 30, 40 years because they have been subsidized so highly by the state. So that is our next point. If we are in the economic crisis now and financial crisis now, we have to review our budgets and the budget has to have clear priorities and the, and, and, the, and the priorities have to go not first to the bankers, they have to go first to the people who are doing good jobs and should be paid for their good jobs, for caring work, for constructive work, for community work. And the other thing is we have to go down with the defense budget and we have to change the research budget, what I try to do as a member of the European Parliament. I have written a report in which I said every research money for nuclear energy should go down 50% and the 50% more research money for renewables. My personal and the green attitude is uh, cutting down any budget for uh, the nuclear industry. But as I can only make political decisions in a coalition, because the Greens had only 8% of the vote, so I have to look for colleagues who support it so that, that I get at least something through. So I made the compromise, but it was a rather radical compromise, cutting down the research budget for everything going into nuclear by 50% and um, increasing renewables uh, research money and not only research money but money to uh, help to open a market because that is the next step. Have the technolo 
technological knowledge for renewable energies, but the next step is how to open and keep a market for it. And for that you need incentives. So this I did with my colleagues in the European Parliament too. Think about and increase incentives for renewable energies. And then think about political structures you need in municipalities, you need in state governments and in national governments, and we now in Europe, even on European level, what type of energy laws, what type of decision-making laws we have to change so that we can rid, get rid of the contracts and the subsidies for the nuclear industry and get laws and decision-making which very quickly increase the good incentives and feed-in tariffs for renewables. So we are saying we want to stop the so-called the, the, Within the European treaties of the European Union, there is one element on research and energy and is uh, linked to that Europe should be a sort of nuclear community. So the Greens, since 30 years, are lobbying to dissolve that treaty and to change it now. And now we have an alliance with some social democrats and with some NGOs in Europe called Eurosolar. European solar industry support, that we want to change that treaty into a treaty for a Europe for renew renewable energies. And I think it would be wonderful if we could do that together, that changing the energy laws, changing the laws for incentives and subsidies, and changing the laws to give people the decision making in a municipality, in a regional community, that they can decide themselves if they want to get their electricity or their heating water um, from a huge uh, electric utility like General Electrics and all these guys I do not like, or in Germany from Siemens or Vattenfall, or what my electricity now in Berlin, I'm very happy, I know it's coming from a little village in the Black Forest, they're a full village, I think 500 people uh, live there, they have the full village with 500 houses, are producing solar energy. So, and with the new feed-in tariffs, which the Greens introduced in the National Parliament, and it was supported by the Social Democrats, um, I can now get feed-in non-nuclear electricity from that uh, village in the uh, Black Forest. And there are windmills now, if you come to Germany, thousands of windmills you can see if you go by train near to Denmark, near to the Baltic Sea. Some people do not like it because it changes the landscape, but for me it's always a symbol. Ah, the next windmill is a symbol. We go out of the dependency and of the imperialism and out of the oil wars. So I see each good windmill as a symbol. We are going a step further in the direction of peace and a step further to get independent from oil wars and oil dependency.